for this morning is Mr. Kelly Davis. Kelly is an elder law attorney practicing probate, trust, and estate, and elder law from offices in Cheyenne, Wyoming. With over 35 years experience dealing with legal issues of concern to the elderly, the disabled, and their families, Mr. Davis's practice focuses on helping seniors, persons with disabilities, and their families in finding solutions to long-term care and nursing home needs, qualifying for Medicaid benefits, maintaining dignity and control while improving their quality of life, protecting their estates, and avoiding probate costs and taxes. A graduate of the University of Oklahoma and the University of Wyoming College of Law, Mr. Davis has been a frequent speaker on estate planning, Medicaid, special needs trust, and general elder law topics. Practi uh, licensed to practice law in Wyoming and Colorado, he's a member of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys and the Wyoming State Bar, Elder Law and Disability Section, and serves on the Board of Directors of the Wyoming Guardianship Corporation. Uh, again, Kelly is, is a treasure for Wyoming. He's probably the go-to source for elder law in the state of Wyoming, and so we are so happy to have you here today. Welcome. Okay. Let's talk about the aging face uh, of America. Right now, according to the U.S. Administration on Aging in the, in the uh, 2010 census, there's over 40 million Americans who are age 65 or over. It's a pretty good population. It's 13% of the population. Some of you, I'll bet, are, are among that group, or at least you know some of what's in, what's in that group, right? Of that, in the next uh, five years older, we drop down to almost 28 million, or 9% of the population are over age 70. When we get down to the age 85 bracket, about 1.8% uh, of the population, or about 5.5 million individuals, fall into that area that we would call elders. If I can use that that label. According to the Alzheimer's Association, which is one of the sponsors here, and I want to thank them for for, for help putting this thing uh, together. I think it's important. <coughs> anyway, of that population, as we age, we face the possibility of Alzheimer's, right? With multiple de dementing conditions, and uh, according to their statistics, about five. 0.2 million Americans over 65, one in eight Americans have Alzheimer's. The question is, how far has it progressed? That's the, that's the issue. Uh, when we get up to 85 year old bracket, 43% of the Americans, according to uh, Alzheimer's Association, suffer from the disease. Now, the numbers are projected to double in our region, in the Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Wyoming region by uh, 2025, that's in a 20 year, 20 year bracket. So uh, that tells me that many of you may end up being affected by Alzheimer's or another dementing condition. And you need to prepare yourself for that. Uh, they do say that there's the higher level of education can help compensate to the changes in the brain linked to Alzheimer's by building a cognitive uh, reserve. So that's why you're here, right? You're, you're here to, to, to help uh, uh, stave off the, what may otherwise be an inevitable. The ultimate goals for many people as they age are to um, maintain the maximum control over their lives. It's really a question of dignity. We don't want to give, give up the reins. And that's, that's, uh, that, that's critical. The thing is, uh, uh, it's connected to the issue of dignity. The dignity that I'm going to be talking about goes a little bit further. We're going to be talking about end-of-life dignity. But well, we're going to get to that point. Which, uh, uh, for those of you who may not suffer a demanding condition in your later years, it's still going to be an issue. It's still going to be an issue. So what do you do? How do you achieve uh, uh, these goals? Well, you have to plan ahead. That's critical. You have to take the steps to put a plan together while you still can. And while you still can becomes an issue that uh, attorneys such as myself have to deal with. Is the person able to do this? You'd be surprised. With, uh, how far we can go down with capacities. 
levels and still have some uh, uh, prepared documents that may be necessary. When we, um, let me, let me, I know that some of you uh, may be here thinking that well, I'm going to talk about how to do a trust, okay, or how to d do wills, things like that, the, the, the typical planning uh, uh, tools. When should we use a, a, a trust for, for Medicaid planning? Um, that really isn't going to be what we're going to focus on. And I tell you, let me just tell you a story. A number of years ago, I had an individual and his wife come in to my office. Uh, he had been diagnosed with a, uh, with a dementing condition, rapidly progressing dementing condition. And he said he wanted one of them trusts to keep the government from taking everything when he dies. Okay. So what does that tell me? Uh, maybe it's a tax issue, and, a, and a, a, there's certain types of trusts we use for that area. Maybe not. Maybe it's another issue. So I said, saying, what do you mean take everything when, when you die? And he says, you know, if I have to go to the nursing home. Well, that just walks away from a whole bunch of uh, planning techniques. The living trust, which many of you would be familiar with, does absolutely nothing for you when we're talking about Medicaid. Under federal statute, and Wyoming follows the, the, the federal statute, a revocable trust, the living trust, is considered as a resource, an available resource for the, uh, the grantor, and therefore it's not, a, it's not a, 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 a safe that we can put our assets in and preserve them. There are trusts that you can do that, uh, but there are certain, certain uh, re requirements. Uh, one of them is that you know you'd be under age 65, and this gentleman he was in his 80s, and I could figure that out by looking at the intake sheet that uh, he was obviously not eligible for that. The other is something called an intentionally defective grantor trust, and with that type of tool, it's an irrevocable trust. We put the assets into it, but we can't make application for five years to, to let it season. Uh, so it becomes a question. If this person, if we set this trust up, and then they have to venture into the long-term care facility uh, the next day, the next month, the next year, how are we going to pay for their coverage? So you have to find out how many assets do they have. So I asked him, what do we have? And he had a modest home and about $60,000 in retirement. He was a salesman all his life. Okay. Uh, it takes about $375,000 to cover, cover the uh, five-year look back uh, a period. So it just wasn't there. So I told uh, Mr. Smith that uh, probably the best thing we could do for him was you know, write a will so he could name who the uh, personal representative is and uh, waive uh, the requirement of bond, dictate how the assets are going to be distributed, and do something as simple as a power of attorney, an effective power of attorney. He didn't want to hear that. He, he had the, the, the idea that, by God, he wanted to have, have, the, have, the, have the big enchilada, and I was just not cooperative. So fine, we, uh, they left the office. About two years later, uh, his wife and one of the children are in my office, and they are in a, a panic. Dad's in the nursing home. He's gone through his 100 days of Medicare coverage. So now he's getting into, into the private pay realm. And as I say, there's not much there. So I say, okay, when you left, uh, uh, did, what'd you do? Do you have a power of attorney? He says, yeah, we went to another attorney, an estate planner, who uh, uh, prepared a power of attorney, and he prepared a trust. Well, I want to see these, okay? And there it was, a revocable trust, a living trust. Absolutely no help for, for them. Uh, I look at the power of attorney, and there's missing language in the power of attorney, missing for what I do. So these are two, two critical documents. At his asset level, we could get him on Medicaid. That's no problem. The problem is that after you're on Medicaid, for uh, generally in, a, in, a, in the an first anniversary, it's going to be within the first anniversary, Medicaid wants to do a reassessment. They pool all the assets together uh, when, when we qualify. But then when they do the reassessment, they only look to the, uh, the Medicaid recipient. If their name is on any asset, that asset is counted in their column, they become over-resourced, and 
the spouse gets thrown out on the street. So this is a crisis situation. And I pointed that out to, to this uh, to, to this lady says, we need to do something about it. So then I start delving into, looking into the trust. And the attorney who prepared this trust, uh, uh, the language he used would, translates to every dime the trust has to go pay for his nursing home care. And there's a location that the wife would go to and let's go to hell. And uh, that's, uh, you know, not what I like to see. Well, so we can, we can amend the trust, okay? We can revoke this trust, we can deal with it. The document said that it required both of the grantors to amend or revoke the trust, and he was, was incapacitated. He didn't have the ability to do it. So what are my options? Well, maybe I could transfer the assets, and, and the way it's working, it's half goes to him, half to her, back out of the trust, but then it's all sitting over, uh, uh, some of it's sitting in his name. I would say all of it was sitting in his name. And the power of attorney didn't have a gifting power, so I could take it from him and give it to his wife. I gotta go to court. I gotta go to court and show the judge that this document creates this nightmare, and this is what the federal statute says we're supposed to do. Under federal law, we're supposed to take the assets from the institutionalized spouse and as quickly as possible give them to the community spouse. So that's what we ended up doing. We broke the trust. But it was about a $5,000 visit uh, to the courthouse. And uh, you know my options were, were, were limited to that, whereas if we'd spent a couple hundred bucks on a power of attorney that had the right language, we could have done it. You know, if, if we had the, the, the right language in the trust, life would have been easier. But so it is important that, uh, uh, that the steps be taken while you still have the legal capacity to act, okay? That's the, the, the story that's supposed to scare you. What is capacity? Well, capacity, let's just look at Black's Law Dictionary. And it's defined as the mental ability to understand the nature and effect of one's actions. Pretty uh, simple uh, dictionary definition. And competency under Black's is the mental ability to understand problems and make decisions. That doesn't help me much. You know, that, what does that mean? What does that mean when I apply it to an individual? Well, we have to look at, uh, look at the, the, the surrounding facts. When it comes to capacity to act, it is not an all or nothing condition. I think this thing might have skipped over a, no it didn't. Uh, it's not an all or nothing condition. You can have various degrees of capacity in the eyes of the law. Some people will sit down and tell you, by the way, lawyers included, that, uh, Capacity is a legal determination that can only be made by the judge. That is not true. Incompetency to the level of having a uh, conservatorship appointed or guardianship appointed, that's the legal determination by the court. But capacity isn't. We have a lot of flexibility in what capacity is. We can have, uh, uh, you know, like I say, it's, it's contextual. What are we trying to achieve? What are we trying, trying to do? Contractual capacity. You know, does the person understand the, the, the nature of, of, of the action that they're taking? What the consequences are? Donative capacity. Donative capacity is uh, uh, the ability to understand that by making a gift, it's no longer yours. We ask our clients often when Mrs. Smith says she wants to give the house to the kids, my first question is why? Well, but so this, they won't take it, da, 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 or, or in case something happens to me. And what is that something? Is it your death or otherwise? You know. Uh, then we say, to Mrs. Mrs. Smith, if we give your house to your daughter, is it still going to be your house? You'd be surprised how many times it's, yeah, it's still going to be my house. I'm living in it. That's an indication of lack of donative capacity. Uh, the uh, uh, it's a case I'm aware of right now. Uh, it's in front of Adult Protective Services in which the lady uh, involved put her kids' names on the checking account. Uh, they took her to the bank, you know, take her Social Security check. Uh, now she has progressed to the point that she is in need of care in a nursing home. That putting the kids' name on the checking account wouldn't have been a problem except the kids took all the money. I'm sure up with a brand new Harley, you know. Uh, 
uh, that's, you know, that's the first thing you want to get, right? And then, and then a pickup truck to haul it around it. And uh, unfortunately, when the application is made for Medicaid, Medicaid says, wait a minute, you know, she, uh, uh, she, she made these gifts. So to me, the question is, did she have donative capacity? And the, the, the people at Adult Protective Services are saying, oh yeah, she intended to make the gift. But they're not asking the questions of whether or not she had the capacity to understand the consequences of that gift. Uh, so I guess we take from this, and I'm going to be talking about it later uh, this afternoon, is don't assume that the people you know know what, know what they're talking about when it talks about donated capacity, contractual capacity, uh, testamentary capacity. In my realm of practice, we always say, read the law, look at the facts, read the law, look at the facts, read the, don't assume that you remember what, the, what that law is, because the law changes as it is applied to, to the facts. We have testamentary capacity, uh, the ability to, to make a will. Uh, testamentary capacity is uh, one of the lowest levels of capacity that there is, because you know, it's not affecting you now while you're alive, it doesn't affect you until you're dead. So we can, we can uh, allow uh, a lesser capacity, or the capacity to make a health care decision. Now, uh, the thing about dealing with capacity issues, you know, persons with diminished capacity, you've all experienced this, I'm sure, you have good days and you have bad days. You know, it's, a, it's that simple. You know, the, the, the good days are a blessing and the bad days, well, we, we work through it. Uh, uh, as their condition pro progresses, we might start seeing good moments and bad moments. You know, the sundowner syndrome. Let's, let's do this at uh, 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 early in the morning and, and not later in the afternoon. You'd be surprised how many of my clients are functioning better after 2 o'clock. The, and the assistant Arnold says, oh, no, no, afternoon they're going to be, be deteriorating. Well, no, nope, they don't get up until, until later in the day. Uh, now, in estate planning, attorneys look for what is called that lucid moment. The moment of the act. The moment of signing the document. Did they understand what they were doing? And frankly, if, if we are able to capture uh, a moment they understand wh what we're doing at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I really don't care if at 3 o'clock they don't understand that they don't recall. It's the lucid moment. That's the intricacies of the law. Okay? The law recognizes that we have moments that are good and moments that are not. Eventually you run out of lucid, lucid moments and then we fall into that realm of being uh, incapacitated. So incapacitated person is defined under Black's Law as someone who is impaired by an intoxicant, uh, mental illness or deficiency, or by physical illness or disability to the extent the person's decision making uh, is impossible. Now that doesn't tell us a lot other than if we look at it it uh, uh, indicates that we're talking about a, uh, some form of deficit causing a reduction in, uh, in capacity so that they are not able to make a decision. Pretty much the, ba the basics of that. Under our statute in Wyoming, uh, an incapacitated person is one who for re reasons other than being a, a minor, because a minor is incapacitated, they, they're, they're legally uh, uh, in incompetent, uh, the person can't properly manage or take care of himself or his property as a result of medical conditions uh, of advanced age, physical disability, disease, use of alcohol. The, 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 de the definition that we're, that, we're, that we're looking up here, again, it's uh, um, a condition and the inability to act because of that, that con condition. It is a judicial determination, generally, in competency in this state. Other states have a different, you need to understand, other states have different lingo. But in this state, that's where we're at, incompetency is a judicial determination that triggers the guardianship. Anybody here working with somebody who's under guardianship? Yeah, it's uh, uh, not my first tool that I ever reach for. The guardian is a person who's qualified uh, under our statute being appointed by the court to exercise powers granted by the court. This exercising powers granted by the court opens up the door for something called uh, uh, decision su support. That's where we're moving away from the idea of actually replacing 
the decision-making capacity, the right to make a decision for the, for the person under guardianship, and just assisting them in making decisions. Understanding that there are certain things that they can do, we just need to be able to help them with those things that they can't. Uh, conservators is the person who's appointed to handle the finances. The thing about uh, being a uh, guardianship, a uh, conservatorship, and by the way, those names are, are, are different too. You know, a conservatorship in uh, uh, California deals with handling personal decisions as well as finances for anybody over 18, and a guardianship is for someone who's under. Uh, in, gosh, in Connecticut, it's not called a conservator, it's called a conservator. Uh, but, you know, it's really the same situation. You've got a surrogate appointed to make the decision. But we, appoint, we make a petition to the court and establish that the person is unable to handle their affairs. And then the guardian is appointed. I use the term guardian to include conservator. Uh, the statutes uh, uh, pool those together. They are a, fid a fiduciary. A fiduciary has certain legal obligations. It's the highest duty that there is. We're going to be talking more about that shortly. And we've got some materials there for, for you to, to, to take with you. The uh, guardian has to file a, an annual or a semi-annual semi report with the court. It's a guardianship of the person. Every six months we have to tell the judge what's going on. And if it's a guardian of the estate, a conservator, we've got to tell the judge every uh, year what we're doing with the money. A lot of times people just blow that off. They, the kids get appointed for the guardianship for, for their parent, and that's the last we ever hear of them. And then they, uh, uh, they get a letter from the judge maybe five years down the road saying, we're going to hold you in contempt oh. because you haven't filed a report. Uh, that's when they start, wait a minute, I'm supposed to do something? Uh, I thought I could do whatever I wanted to do. No, no you can't. Uh, that's what we find in some of the smaller counties, uh, the smaller judicial districts where they don't see this as often. In the bigger judicial districts, the Toronto County, uh, Laramie County, Albany County, they're on top of it. They don't let those uh, uh, reports slide for very, very long for the person's parole called in to talk to the judge. When the big thing about uh, a guardianship, the thing that bothers me, it's why I reach for that tool last, is that it takes away the ward's right to make determinations for themselves. It takes away their rights. I don't want to do that, you know? I, I, uh, I guess it's, if I, I'm more in favor of letting that the, the, the ward make as many decisions as, as they can. So how do we achieve that? How do, we, how do we avoid the guardianship? The tool we use is the power of attorney. Now, everybody's heard of what power of attorney is, right? Well, Basically, it's a legal instrument where, you, where the, uh, uh, the uh, principal or grantor is giving someone else the authority to, to act on behalf of that principal. It's a grant of authority. Keeping in mind, it's a piece of paper. Okay? That's all it is. It's a piece of paper. It doesn't get anything done by itself. Uh, with the traditional power of attorney, this is all we had when I went to, to law school, uh, uh, under the common law, I could give you the ability to sell my house. And I could give you the ability to handle my finances. And I could give you the ability to, to go to the doctor for I, I could do all those things. But if I lost my capacity, if I suffered a stroke or a dementing condition, I could no longer do it myself, you wouldn't be able to do it for me. Your ability to act for, for me would cease because I can't do it. You can't sell my house, you can't handle my finances. I have no choice but do a guardianship. Well, about 37 years ago, the legislature adopted the durability statute. And with the durable power of attorney, if we use magic language, we can uh, authorize the agent under the power of attorney. By the, again, they're not called the power of attorney, they're called an agent or an attorney in fact. Uh, we can authorize them to take action in spite of the incapacitating event. In other words, if I use the magic words in the document, and they are magic words, uh, even though I suffered the stroke, you could still sell my house, you could still handle my finances, your ability to act for me did not, uh, is not terminated by my incapacitating event, therefore it is durable. 
that every state in the nation has a durability statute. In Wyoming, we have to use magic words saying that this is a durable power of attorney. In the surrounding states, they've adopted uh, the Uniform Power of Attorney Act, which presumes that all powers of attorney are durable, unless you say it's not. So there's, there's a shift in, 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 the, in uh, the, uh, uh, the language that we're using, the, the legal approach. With the power of attorney, you can have something called a limited power of attorney. I don't know how many times people say, oh, I got the power of attorney. I can do anything. I can do anything. So well, let me see the document. And sorry, it's very limited in what you can do. The things that we need to do, like the case I was telling you about with the, with the gentleman, it's not in there. It's limited. So uh, the power of attorney would say that all you can do is hit, sell my house. All you can do is handle my finances. That's it. That's all I'm granting you the authority to do. So then we get to the general power of attorney. And the general power of attorney is more expansive in the scope of the authorities that it grants. In my office, when we have someone who is uh, fully competent, uh, we will use a uh, long form power of attorney in which we're granting all the powers that the court would grant a court appointed guardian called up, they're called plenary powers. We're, we're uh, uh, granting that authority, but then there's some things that we want to be able to do to preserve the estate so that the, the, the assets, the estate that was built up over the lifetime of the client doesn't end up by default going to, it goes to their children rather than to the children of the CEO of the nursing home. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I, I like the, uh, the CEO of the nursing home and his kids. He's my next door neighbor. And, and he comes and shovels my walk at uh, uh, both he and the kid, you know, when it, when it snows. And I always make sure that when it's snowing, I walk out with a limp and a cane just to kind of <laughs> encourage him. But he doesn't need my money. He doesn't need my client's money, okay? So what we do is we use the general power of attorney. Sometimes the general power of attorney can include the health care uh, uh, authority uh, within it. Uh, usually you'll see that like on page six. It, said, you know, it starts out, oh, so-and-so is my agent. They can handle my affairs. They can pay my bills. They can sell my house. They can litigate, da, da, da. Then on page five, six, oh, and they can make health care decisions. Downside of that is who's the audience? The doctor's not going to be looking and waiting until they get to page six to find out who's going to be making the decision. They want to they wanna know now. That's why we use the health care power of attorney, which is usually an alternate document, a secondary document that we use. And even with the, the uh, healthcare power of attorney, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, about 25% of the time, it does not get honored by the doctors. Yes, ma'am. So essentially we'd want the general power of attorney versus the durable? No, 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 no. You, you can be multiple things. Okay. You can have a durable limited, you can have a durable general, you can have a, you can have a non uh, 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 durable limited. Uh, uh, it, it's, okay. They're different things that we're looking at. Uh, good question, though. Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to repeat these questions for, for I am? The question was whether or not we would want a general power of attorney or a durable power of attorney. The answer is generally, you heard what the answer was, yes. Uh, or actually, the accurate answer is maybe. You know, you never get a yes or a no from a lawyer. Uh, now, the last thing you said about healthcare um, power of attorney. Yes, sir. You said that doctors, 25% of doctors... That's the, that's the American Medical Association's number that uh, when they get an advanced directive, they don't pay attention to it. They don't pay attention to it because think of the environment they're in. They're in the emergency room. They're trying to stabilize the person. Uh -huh. And at the end of this, this advanced directive, this healthcare power of attorney, which are really two different things in a way, Healthcare power of attorney says, I want this person to make the decision. Advanced directive is uh, what that decision is, okay? But uh, uh, they're sitting there trying to stabilize the patient that just came in. And if there's an instruction there uh, about uh, uh, the administration of artificial life support, they're not going to do it. They're, they're, they're not going to look at it. They're going to go ahead and do what they need to do to stabilize. They're, they're going to blow right through that. And if you have your agent standing up there and say, wait a minute, it says right here in the power of attorney. You're not supposed to do that. They may end up calling the sheriff and have you removed. That's the reality. Have you removed by the sheriff? 
really? Okay, and then the law then you make the phone call to the lawyer and the lawyer steps in. I had a similar situation with my mother when her passing. Uh, she uh, suffered a massive stroke. Uh, she had been in the nursing home uh, uh, because of uh, her dementing condition. It's no longer safe to, for her to uh, be in the, in, in the environment uh, uh, where she was at the assisted living facility. She, her entry into the, the nursing home was through urinary tract infection, something that you can cure, but it still leaves uh, its toll. The, uh, with her, her, the, the stroke that took her out, uh, we'd made the decision following her instructions that she wanted to go to the hospice facility, to Davis Hospice, one of the best ones in the United States. And so we were giving that instruction to transfer her to Davis Hospice. They put her up into the, uh, admitted her to the hospital, and then they're gonna kick her over to, to Davis. You know, it takes a few minutes to do this. When we arrive, they're starting to intubate her. They're getting ready to, to give her IVs, a, a, a solution. We know that was not what her wishes were. So I'm saying to the, the, to the, the nurse, why are you doing that? Because the doctor says we're supposed to we'll get the doctor in here. The doctor says, uh, is there a problem? He says, yeah, we don't want you to do that. Well, this is what we do here. This is our protocol. We're going to do this. He says, you're not going to do that to my mom. Yeah, we're going to do this. This is, this is I, the next statement was going to be, we're going to call the cops. And I said, well, let's just go down and talk to the judge right now and we'll see who wins this argument. And that caused her to swear off the case, so to speak, and bring the hospice doctor in who understood what the, what the instructions were. So that's what I'm saying. It, the uh, advanced healthcare directive, don't count on it working for you. Don't rely on it. People think, oh, I got this taken care of. And you don't, you don't. There's also, uh, uh, the, the advanced directive is kind of like a living will. It's akin to it in many ways. Then there's the psychiatric advanced directive, something that is authorized under our statute. It's something that's handled by the, uh, uh, the Department of Health. They have a form online. Uh, when a person who has a, uh, a, 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 a medical condition, uh, a mental illness, if they are stabilized, they can make a statement as to what meds they want and what, what meds they don't want. And that is supposed to be honored too, but having someone advocate for you is, becomes, becomes the issue. Did that answer your question? Are you up to me? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, that just took me aback because uh, uh, I have already taken steps to uh, have a uh, medical uh, power of attorney mm -hmm. with the daughter, and I had no idea that that would obtain what you just uh, may, said. I'm just saying it may be a problem. I'm not guaranteeing that it's going to be a problem. I'm just saying be prepared. Be prepared. Plan ahead. I'm sorry? Yeah, I can see both sides. And uh, if you are taken to an emergency room uh, <coughs> and incompetent, uh, make it, I could see that being allowed. So I suppose you could do a health care uh, power of attorney that would speak. Uh, it's, it's actually it's addressed under the, the statute. It's actually addressed under the statutes about the availability of the agent that's appointed under the uh, uh, under the, the, the document. So it, it, it is addressed. But I'm, my point is, don't expect that your document is going to be honored. That's what I'm trying to stress here. The, in order to do a power of attorney, you have to have the legal capacity to act. You know? So that's why it's important to me when this gentleman came in that we didn't do the trust for him. He says, you know, we can do a power of attorney. He had the capacity to do that at that point. When he, it was brought to my attention two years later, he lacked that capacity, so we had fewer options. So the capacity to execute a power of attorney is recognized as contractual capacity. Uh, the, uh, the contractual capacity, it's really measured as to what you want to accomplish, what's the, what's the effect that you're trying to, to, to achieve. Um, with the uh, contractual capacity is the ability to understand the nature and effect of the act and the business that, that's uh, being uh, going to be carried out. The more complex the, the act, the more the greater the level of capacity that it takes. Uh, so that uh, to hire an attorney requires contractual capacity. Okay? The level of capacity to hire the attorney is relatively low. The 
uh, executing a uh, insurance uh, retrocision agreement requires a high level of capacity. Of course, it may just be that you have to have the capacity to hire the attorney to explain it to you and, and say it's okay to sign. Somebody you can sue. But at uh, 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 any rate, that, that, that's what the, the basic rules are. The uh, uh, healthcare decision making capacity is the ability to understand the, the intended benefits of a, medical, a proposed medical procedure. What are the significant risks? What are the reasonable alternatives? that you can formulate a rational opinion regarding it and that you can communicate. That's an element that we find in both contractual capacity and in the healthcare decision capacity is the ability to communicate. And communication may not be the uh, uh, s verbalizing a sentence. It can be pointing to, to pictures on a chart. It can be squeezing the hand, the blinking of an eye. Uh, it doesn't have to be the full conversation. We just have to be sure that the person understands what we're looking at, they, that they understand that, that if we don't uh, amputate their leg, they're going to die. Yes? How do you as a lawyer make that decision that somebody is competent? That's actually the focus of the afternoon session. So it, 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 uh, there are standards, there's cases that we have to, have to look to and say, what are we trying to achieve? What is, uh, does this person understand that? And one of the things we do is we ask, why are you doing this? Tell me what, wh what we're doing. That's what we, that we have the conversation uh, uh, with them. When uh, a person is serving under a power of attorney or a guardianship, they are subject to uh, a certain duties, the fiduciary duties, the breach of which can result in, in criminal or uh, civil uh, charges. I'm looking at the time here. We've got time. In the materials, you have this book here. Okay, it is uh, a publication by the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, you you have it printed out, and you can actually get these online, or you can get, order them uh, 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 from from the federal government. I get them in in you know, like boxes of a hundred, uh, and we sign documents, we hand them out. It explains what is the fiduciary duty. I can sit here and say what to a client. Well, uh, or to the kid, uh, uh, pardon? Yeah, 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 it is. It is. It's in there. It's a Xerox copy of it. For agents under a power of That's right. That's it. That's that puppy. And uh, I knew I wasn't hallucinating it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is this is written in layman's terms. It's a va valuable little tool. The there we went on the floor. Um, some of the duties that we look to, uh, fiduciary duties, both of a guardian and uh, an agent under a power of attorney, is the duty to comply with the, with the document. If the document doesn't give you the authority to do something, you don't go do it. You know, If it, it doesn't have a gifting power, you don't go out and make gifts. That becomes exploitation. That becomes felony. So we don't do that. Uh, the failure to comply with the terms can uh, render the person liable for any the injury that's sustained by the principal. What's so frustrating for me is so often we, we see, you know, after the fact, cases where someone has exploited uh, a senior uh, a citizen using a power of attorney and the money all got spent uh, and we don't have any money to recover and Adult Protective Services says, oh, well, we're not going to, to pursue this matter or the sheriff's department says, well, it's a civil matter. And I tell you what, lawyers don't go to court without getting paid. And if there's no money left, what we've just done is we've just thrown uh, a vulnerable adult out on the trash heap. And that really upsets me. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make some changes in the Adult Protective Services Act to, to, to uh, bring some authority to bear, to bring some, some resources to bear to take care of the seniors. The, uh, uh, to the extent possible, the agent must involve the principal in the decision-making process. That's one of the basics. So even though we have someone who may have a dementing condition, maybe they may be stepping into that darkness, we still have to try and communicate with them to see what they, what they can understand. And that's where Kyle's uh, presentation was so helpful. How are you going to communicate with them? Because you've got a fiduciary duty to do that. There's a duty of loyalty. Every action that the agent takes under the power of attorney must be for the good of the agent. Excuse me, 
backwards. But be good if they're good to the principal and not for the agent. You know? I don't appoint you as my agent so you so 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 you get so you're better off. I appoint you as the agent to help me get things done for me. That's critical. That's critical. Uh, so the agent has a duty to keep the principal safe and comfortable. In other words, we're not supposed to cruise the, the highways and byways of Wyoming looking for the for the one um, uh, nursing home in the state that is Eisenhower uh, era building cinder blocks that has the lowest rate because we want to save as much money for the kids. That's not what we're supposed to be doing here. Okay, we're supposed to be doing uh, services for the for the principal. That's why they appointed you. Uh, it's more important for their well-being than to save money for those uh, who would inherit. Now, unless otherwise authorized, the agent has to avoid actions that modify the principal's estate plan. You're going to find in Medicaid planning, we look to the estate plan to see who the heirs are going to be. And then that's where we target our, our efforts to try and implement that estate plan to try and preserve some of the, some of the estate uh, uh, for, for those heirs. But we don't write new heirs into the plan. We don't do that. Uh, they have a duty to avoid conflicts of interest. And conflict of interest is something that people um, uh, often view as an argument. It's not. It's a conflict of legal interest. Uh, here's an example. I'll, I'll just I'll use my parents again. If you came to visit me in my office, you'd be surprised how many times a week I kill my mother and kill my mother-in-law. <laughs> you know, they're, they're examples that we could, that we could use. Uh, in order to keep my uh, parents in their home for as long as we could, we had to move my brother in to, into the house, basically putting his, his life on hold. Well, he's my big brother. He can handle it, and, and he didn't have a social life anyway. Just ask me. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we, we moved him in, but I didn't think it was fair that he should be uncompensated for that. So we sold him the house for what mom and dad owed on. Basically, he refinanced it and uh, uh, the equity in the house, I guess we got about five minutes. The equity in the house was then uh, uh, given to him as compensation. The, uh, if he had signed the deed transferring the property, that would be a conflict of interest because as a buyer, you want to get the lowest possible price. As a seller, you want to get the highest possible price. And him getting it at the lowest possible price was a conflict of interest. It was a violation of his duty. He had to step aside, and I stepped up into the role of the, of the agent on that for the transaction. Ultimately, it was fair for mom and dad. It gave him another 20 months in their house, which uh, otherwise they would not have had. Uh, uh, they had to be removed from the environment for other reasons, like falling on the floor, and, and no one can, can think to call 911 because they had two dimensions of patients in the, in the house. The uh, keeping the assets separate is, is something that, 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 that is important. Uh, uh, the duty to act prudently. As the agent under a power of attorney, you can't take the principal's money and go invest in the lotto tickets. I don't care what the fortune cookie said the lucky numbers were. I mean, it's not your money. You know, that's not a prudent thing. You, you're supposed to collect rents. You're supposed to... Uh, uh, make sure that the property is, is, is insured. You know, that's prudent. Uh, make sure the house is insured. A duty to maintain the accurate records. Under guardianship, you have to report to the court what you're doing, uh, either every six months or every year, depending upon guardianship or conservatorship. Well, although we don't have that uh, court reporting requirement under a power of attorney, you still have a duty to report to the, to the individual uh, under guardianship, so not a guardianship, but under the uh, under the power of attorney to the principal, it comes touchy when the principal doesn't understand what's going on when they when they've transitioned to that. But the duty still stands. What we put into our powers of attorney is having a surrogate in place to report what's uh, the accounting to, so someone else can can look over the the financial records and see if something untoward is happening. The uh, duty to accounting. Uh, uh, I've, I've, I've addressed that. You can't do an accounting without having a, a um, uh, uh, accurate records. The duty not to delegate responsibilities. 
We see this all the time, and it comes, and it, 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 it's a nightmare. I, I see it coming out of lawyers' offices, where mom is appointed Sister Sally and Sister Jane as co co agents under the power of attorney because she doesn't want to pick one over the other. It doesn't allow one of them to serve and the other one not to. I don't care what the language says in, in the document. As a practical matter, the banker's going to say, you both have to be here at the same time because you're going to say cash in the CD and you're going to say don't cash in the CD. As the banker, I don't want to be caught up in the middle of that. So you can't delegate that responsibility. You have to, you have to be there. Making the document work, it's not just a piece of paper. You have to have language in there that's going to make it effective. And there I just... Okay, uh, so words matter. There are certain things that we put in there, like a statement uh, we see in many powers of attorney, people get offline, that says that the agent, am I, am I out of time now? Okay, okay. And, uh, those five minutes, is that five consecutive minutes? <laughs> okay, just wanted to know, just, just, just clarify that for everyone. That uh, you know, it says, I call them, any get your guts. Uh, anything I can do, you can do for me. You didn't know you are going to have a singing performance here. Uh, <laughs> that does not grant any authority. All it does is it describes the extent of the authority that's otherwise granted in the document. So if I give you a power of attorney that says you can sell my house, and anything I can do, you can do for me, you can list it, you can paint it, you can do all these things to, br to bring it up. Uh, clear triggering events are important. Don't just say when the person is incapacitated, how do we determine what incapacity is? Uh, Medicaid planning tools. Medicaid's pretty important. It's the insurance program for the middle class. You know, uh, we're not all the Koch brothers that can build our own nursing home. So, let's see. Uh, I mentioned the accounting. Uh, getting them honored, as I said. Don't expect your advance director to be honored by the medical professionals. They're busy. There is an alternative. That is the provider's order of life-sustaining treatment, the pulse. <coughs> 31 states have it. We had the statute adopted, uh, not this last session, but the previous session. It, uh, we went to the Department of uh, Health. They did the, uh, uh, the regulations, so it went into effect around in, in May, April, May. What it is, it's a, a document where you can say what you want if you have a life limiting condition. It is a medical order. It is a standing order. Under the statutes, the doctors have to follow it. You don't do it yourself, the doctor does it. Yes, ma'am? Kelly, you do that with your uh, primary care physician. You're in the hospital, though. It can also be done in... Hospitalist. There's no primary care physician. Uh, I understand, but it doesn't regard just the primary care physician. Uh, it's, that's why in most states it's called a physician's order of life sustaining treatment. It's a provider's order. You can do it with a uh, uh, um, uh, nurse practitioner, certified nurse practitioner. Uh, if we're talking about her area, uh, we can do it with a physician's assistant. So it's a little bit broader. You do it with them, and it's not on file at the hospital. I mean, did they One of the things that they're that they're they're looking at doing is they're rolling up the one choice, the old. Uh, bracelet saying, do not resuscitate, right. okay? And people say, oh, well, I got it tattooed on my chest. Yeah, I'm glad you like the tattoos, but it serves, you know, I got a tattoo that says, I'm, I'm gonna regret this tattoo when I get old. You know, <laughs> it, uh, it, it doesn't do any good. You know, because there's a process that has to be followed. They're looking at re re removing that and starting up a central registry. Uh, what they do is they take that uh, standing uh, order, uh, medical order, and they're, and they're saying, doctors say, well, put it on your refrigerator door if you're home. Make, you know, make it available so people will see that this is what we want. We don't want uh, invasive procedures, or we do. You know, we, we don't want CPR, or we do. You know, we want limited care, we want full treatment. You know, just so, so we're still breaking ground on, on that in Wyoming, trying to get the doctors educated that they're supposed to deal with that. If your doctor did it with you, and you have it in a doctor's office on file. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be? <laughs> it's yours. It's handed to you. It oh, travels with have, you. Okay. And then if you're in the nursing home, it goes in your file in the nursing home. You can have it on file at the hospital. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. If you have a uh, power of attorney in another state, and there's a possibility you will be at a uh, point uh, uh, being cared for in that state rather than here in Wyoming. Uh-huh. 
do you need to have a power of attorney uh, made up for the state of Wyoming and a power of attorney made up for the other? You have to look at the intricacies of, this, of the state. If you're just visiting in that state, I think under the full faith and credit clause, your document would be honored. But do you really want to go to court to have it proven? Okay? Yeah. <laughs> That's the, so it, it's, you have to be more specific in, in, in that situation. We have people transporting their documents all the time. What it is in that state. Yeah, yeah. In some, certain states, they don't recognize a springing power of attorney. In other states, all powers of attorney are springing powers. So that's, that, that's what you have to look for, the intricacies. The, uh, selecting the agent is, 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 is critical. Don't just pick someone because they're the oldest child. Don't just pick them because the oldest child is in prison, and so we pick the next one. Uh, you know, uh, they, They've got to be someone who's trustworthy, that has an e even temperament. That in a crisis, they're not going to fall apart. That uh, they have the requisite, requisite skill set. That they know, how, if they can't balance their own checking book, checkbook, don't expect them to balance yours. Okay? And, and that you can depend upon them. You need really to consult with an attorney. There's a, out in the community, you can get uh, legal Zoom documents. And I see them all the time. I love legal Zoom documents. Because I know that I can charge more to backfill the hole that that person created trying to use this power of attorney whereas if they'd just gone to an attorney to begin with and got the right language to start out with we'd be better off so this is something that cheapness doesn't exactly work out to your your benefit and questions so yes you were talking about the previous guy that used the wrong attorney, um, the wrong wording of the attorney he, The attorney he used is a good attorney if you had estate tax issues. Yeah, so but how do you know that you've got the correct wording in place? There's, there's certain things you want to look for, okay? And one is, you know, the unrestricted... What, what are, we, are we considering that Medicaid might be an issue? Unrestricted gifting power. You'll find that, uh, that many documents, they will sit down and they'll have a gifting power, uh, but it's, re it's restricted. It's restricted to the tax exemption amount, $14,000, okay? Well, we want to be, maybe go beyond that. We, we got a, a, a $300,000 house we were trying to preserve some of. Uh, so $14,000 isn't going to cut it. Uh, the the self-dealing allowing the agent to maybe hire themselves or a family member to provide services which otherwise a stranger would, would be providing. And, but when we hire the family member to do that, they uh, uh, have to have the skill set. You know? they, they can't, we can't hire them to do something that they're not qualified to do. As a matter of fact, that agreement has to be uh, in writing. But before you even get there, under the fiduciary responsibility, the agent can't benefit from serving unless you say self-dealing is all right. And the document I use it says self-dealing is fine as long as it's fair to the principal. If it's not fair, it ain't all right. Uh, the ability to hire an attorney. You'd be surprised how many documents don't even authorize the agent to go and talk to an attorney and hire the attorney to represent the vulnerable adult. And most elder law attorneys do not represent the kids. We represent the senior. That's who our duty goes to. And because of that, we need to have the, a waiver of attorney-client privilege. We have to be able to, to, to freely communicate with, uh, with third parties, particularly when we have someone who has, who has dementia. When I'm doing a Medicaid plan, the very first thing I ask is, is, let me see the power of attorney. And if I find out that the power of attorney isn't there, it doesn't do what I need to do. That's the first step we try to try to, to achieve is see if we can visit and uh, w with the client and uh, capture that document, capture that toolbox. Uh, for you folks, I might use a 12-page document. For someone else, it might just be a six-page document because I've simplified the language that we're, we're dealing with. As a lawyer, the rule of thumb is you say it three times if you really mean it. Or maybe I don't need to say it three times to, if it's just going to be confusing. I use simpler uh, 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 terms. For someone who's uh, maybe mid-staged, I'll use a document that has more one or two word descriptions of what the powers are. There's more of a chance that that's going to be challenged than the 12 page document. So I don't know, how are you going to know? 
uh, I really can't help you on that. It's uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a, a form out there that Bar American Bar Association suggested we use 30 years ago. It's still floating around. You, you'll see it when you you'll know it when you see it. The very first line has your social security number uh, on it. <laughs> Jeez, they're still using that. So, any other questions? Did I get you good and confused? I mean, did, did, uh, yeah. <laughs>